A casual catch-up at a cafe turns deadly when a woman begins convulsing and vomiting foam from her mouth. Tragically, she dies en route to the hospital, prompting an immediate investigation into her death. This is the story of a friendship turned sour, jealousy and evil ultimately leading to a premeditated murder, and Indonesia's trial of the century that followed. Based on reports and first-hand descriptions by the accused and cafe staff, we delve into the case of, the poisoned, Vietnamese iced coffee. Situated on the northwest coast of the island of Java, Jakarta is the economic, cultural, and political center of Indonesia. In this country, less than 20% of the population constitutes the wealthy upper class, while the majority of people have low incomes and survive on as little as $4 a day. Born on October 9, 1988, in Jakarta, Jessica Wongso was part of the elite, individuals whose children studied abroad. She was the youngest of three children born to her parents, Imelda and Winardi Wongso. It was rumored that her family owns a plastic factory, and some people refer to Winardi Wongso as the plastic king due to his significant influence in the business. Jessica's mother, Imelda Wongso, refuted the claim, stating that her family is not as wealthy as the media reported. She clarified that her husband, Winardi Wongso, works as a plastics agent, not a factory owner. In 2005, Jessica's parents relocated to Sydney, Australia, due to their business. The family bought a home in the exclusive harborside suburb of Double Bay, one of the wealthiest spots in Sydney where plots, though relatively small, are worth millions. Jessica did not join her parents as she stayed in Jakarta to complete her high school education. Jessica's family members remember that she always loved playing computer games and drawing. This combination of interests led to her decision to study graphic design. In 2008, after completing high school, Jessica joins her family in Australia and attends Billy Blue Design College in Sydney. Jessica settles into student life and makes many friends due to her carefree personality. It is exactly these traits that caught the attention of another Indonesian-born student at Billy Blue, called Myrna Salihin. Born on March 30, 1988 in Jakarta, Myrna Salihin has a twin sister called Sandy Salihin. According to various sources, their father Eddie Darmawan Salihin is a well-known businessman who owns two large companies, one of which is in the garment industry. Myrna's father mentioned that Myrna had a strong personality, and if she saw something not right, she would stand up. When she was young, Myrna even fought with boys when her sister was bullied. Myrna and Jessica quickly bonded, discovering shared connections in their backgrounds from affluent Jakarta families, a mutual love for design, and both possessing strong personalities. In Sydney, life was enjoyable, and Myrna seamlessly integrated into Jessica's social circle. The quartet of glamorous Jakarta girls, Myrna, Hani, Jessica, and Vera, spent their time together, engaging in the routine of tackling design assignments and attending lectures during the day, followed by lively nights of partying. However, all good things must come to an end. After completing their design degree, Myrna is prepared to return home to Jakarta with her boyfriend, Arif, to embark on the next chapter of their lives together. On the other hand, Jessica remains in Australia to seek employment opportunities and becomes a permanent resident. 
In June 2015, Myrna goes to Sydney for a holiday. She wants to catch up with some of her college friends and spend some leisure time in the lovely Harbour City. She lets Jessica know that she's in town, and they arrange to meet up for dinner. During the dinner, things turn sour when Myrna allegedly advises Jessica to break up with her Australian boyfriend for using drugs, angering Jessica. Jessica simply got up halfway through her meal and left Myrna in the restaurant without saying goodbye. Myrna realized she must have clearly crossed the line. Ever since, Myrna has a lingering uneasiness about Jessica. She confides in her fiancé, Arif, expressing her reluctance to meet Jessica alone in the future. Myrna decides that the next time, she would bring someone with her, either Arif or one of their mutual friends, Hani or Vera. Given that Myrna resided in Jakarta and Jessica in Sydney, they have limited contact. In November 2015, five months after meeting Jessica in Sydney, Myrna married Arif in Bali. Myrna didn't invite Jessica to the wedding. When Arif asked, she said she didn't feel comfortable with Jessica and didn't want anything to potentially spoil their wedding day. On the other hand, Jessica has a troubled history in Sydney. In January 2015, Patrick O'Connor, the boyfriend of Jessica, reported to the police that Jessica had threatened to kill herself with a knife. In August of the same year, Jessica crashed her car into a nursing home only meters from the bedrooms of dozens of elderly residents. The incident attracted a news camera crew and there was footage of an injured Jessica inside an ambulance. Police were of the opinion she had been drinking. On another occasion, Patrick called the police again saying that Jessica had tried to poison herself with the carbon monoxide from a small barbecue inside her bedroom. Nothing happened to Jessica on this occasion, she was unharmed. In 2015 alone, Jessica was taken to hospital five times after failed suicide attempts or self-harm incidents. By the end of November 2015, Patrick had had enough and he approached police to seek a restraining order against Jessica. Jessica worked as a graphic designer at New South Wales Ambulance from July 2014 until the time she was fired in November 2015. Christy Carter, Jessica's former boss at New South Wales Ambulance, shared insights about Jessica. Due to hospitalization for self-harm in October 2015, Jessica was not allowed to return home. Carter told the police that Jessica had said the police treated her like a murderer, and if she wants to kill someone, she knows how she could get a gun. Carter also criticized Jessica over the incident in which she crashed into the nursing home. Jessica didn't show any guilty feeling after hitting a nursing home and nearly killing someone. Carter believes that Jessica has two personalities. She describes Jessica as someone with a kind demeanor who often smiles. Jessica also has another side to her personality, characterized by a quick temper, especially when others fail to comply with her wishes or demands. On December 6, 2015, Jessica returns to Jakarta. Jessica started a WhatsApp chat group with her design friends from Billy Blue before she left Australia. This chat group consists of Myrna, Hani, Vera, and Jessica herself. On December 12, 2015, Jessica meets up with Myrna at a restaurant in North Jakarta where Myrna brings along her newlywed husband, Arif. This is where Jessica heard about Myrna and Arif's wedding for the first time. It must have made for awkward dinner conversation but not much more about this evening is known.
Jessica wants to gather the girls for coffee and suggests they meet up in January 2016. They arrange to meet on Wednesday, January 6th at a cafe in the Grand Indonesian Shopping Mall. Situated in central Jakarta, Grand Indonesia offers an international shopping experience with a wide range of fashion apparel, restaurants, and entertainment choices. On the ground floor of West Mall, Olivier is a European-themed dining establishment that offers fusion menus with a blend of French, Italian, and Asian twists. Even though they have arranged to meet at 5 p.m., on the actual day of the catch-up, Jessica is eager to confirm the drink orders at around 1 p.m. Café Olivier's CCTV cameras capture Jessica entering the café about 90 minutes before her scheduled meeting with friends. She is seen looking around the restaurant before exiting. Jessica returns to the café with three shopping bags carrying soap, supposedly gifts for her two friends and one for herself. Jessica then orders drinks at the counter for her and her friends an iced coffee and two cocktails. The drinks are prepared and served to Jessica. She is seen putting the shopping bags on the table, covering the view of the coffee from the cameras. Myrna and Hani are seen arriving on the CCTV. According to Hani, she and Myrna had asked about the drinks already on the table before they sat down. Myrna then sits in the center, with Jessica to her left and Hani to her right. Myrna takes a sip of her iced coffee. Seconds later, she makes hand gestures to signal that the coffee tasted awful. Hani takes a small sip and confirms that it tastes off. Myrna requests water, and Jessica goes to get it. Myrna continues to wave her hands in front of her mouth and keeps saying that the coffee tasted awful. Myrna asks to order anything sweet immediately, and Hani looks at the menu. Jessica returns and she tells Myrna that she has informed the staff to bring water over. Suddenly, Myrna slumps on her seat and starts convulsing. Her eyes roll back and she starts foaming from the mouth. The waiters rush over to help. Hani calls her name and tries to wake her up, but Jessica just stands there quietly without reacting or helping. Jessica seems calm and devoid of emotion. All this happened less than two minutes after Myrna drank the coffee. With the assistance of the cafe staff, the unconscious Myrna is rushed to the hospital. By 6 p.m., she was declared dead on arrival at the hospital.
Seventy minutes into Myrna's death, a test on her stomach showed no traces of the poison. However, when tests were conducted around three days after her death, just 0.2 milligrams of cyanide were found inside her stomach. Cyanide is naturally present in some foods and in certain plants, such as cassava, apples, lima beans, and almonds. Smoking cigarettes is likely one of the major sources of cyanide exposure, especially for those not working in cyanide-related industries. People have died from breathing in cyanide, consuming the poison, and even from it leaching through their skin and into the bloodstream. Both world wars saw the use of cyanide. In the modern context within Indonesia, some people are still practicing illegal cyanide fishing to capture ornamental fish. The cafe manager initially thought that it could be due to the expired milk in the coffee. Even in that case, the manager wouldn't expect that expired milk would result in convulsions. The manager then believed that Myrna's convulsion was due to her pre-existing illness. What triggered the manager's thoughts was when Jessica asked her, what did you put inside the drink? Jessica's accusation put her on guard. The manager then instructed her staff not to throw Myrna's coffee away. Due to the manager's suspicion, using the straw in the coffee, she tried to taste it with the tip of her tongue and spat it out almost immediately. According to her, it didn't taste like a drink and couldn't be swallowed. The coffee was then transferred to a bottle and handed over to the police. Forensic tests revealed that there was 298 milligrams of cyanide in Myrna's coffee, which was enough to kill her. In order to ascertain the cause of Myrna's death, the Indonesian police suggested conducting a full autopsy. However, a full autopsy was not conducted due to Myrna's family's refusal. Since the tragedy, Jessica has been attending interviews and seems to enjoy the attention from the media. She doesn't appear to be someone who has just lost a close friend. The police have focused on Jessica, as her behavior on the day of Myrna's death raised suspicion. Unfortunately, in the shock and confusion of events, Jessica wasn't searched that day. Can you please describe how you feel now, knowing that your friend Myrna died tragically? I'm very sad and haven't had time to grieve due to the accusations against me. Currently, there are a lot of mixed emotions and stress. I've known Myrna for a long time, and she was truly a good person. Lately, you've been smiling a lot when questioned at the Jaya Regional Police. Is that a cover-up for the sadness you're going through? I want to appear tough and keep moving forward. When I encounter problems, I choose to remain calm, relaxed, and smile because I don't want to be seen crying or appearing sad in front of the media. Internally, though, I feel a deep sadness when thinking about it. Why did it happen? It was just supposed to be a fun and casual catch-up. How did it turn into such a tragedy? It's hard to accept. Myrna mentioned in the chat that since she knew I was coming early, she would also arrive around 4 or so. Perhaps Myrna didn't want me to wait alone. Thinking she would be here in a minute, I ordered the drinks at around 4.30. I ordered the drinks at the counter, paid at the cashier outside, and then went back to the table. I moved the bags, which were meant to be gifts for them, to the right back. Behind. Yes, this is the seat here, there's something like a flower pot or something, big box behind. I moved the bags there, looked at the food menu, and continued playing on my cell phone while waiting for my friends. After Myrna drank the coffee, she felt nauseous. I didn't notice it at first as she was sitting next to me. On your right side. Yes, right side. I only noticed it when Myrna said that the taste of coffee wasn't good. It's awful. It wasn't good, it was weird, something like that. Then she shoved it to me and asked me to try it. I smelled it, and it was really bad. I've never smelled coffee like that. Why didn't you try tasting it? The smell was already bad, so I didn't want to try it. On January 30, 2016, 24 days after Myrna's death, Jessica was arrested and charged with the premeditated murder of her friend. Under Indonesia's Article 340 of the Criminal Code, premeditated murder, 
if found guilty, carries a jail sentence of 20 years to life imprisonment or capital punishment. However, as Jessica is a permanent resident of Australia, the Australian government received a guarantee from Indonesian authorities that she would not be sentenced to death. This agreement was made in exchange for providing evidence from Australia about Jessica and her criminal record. Widely known as Indonesia's trial of the century and broadcasted live on all major stations, this case caught the attention of millions throughout the nation. Can you explain the cyanide in the drink? Do you no, think, I have you, no idea. Did you no put idea. it there? No, of course not. <laughs> okay, well. Jessica's parents engaged Indonesia's famous and top lawyer Otto Hasibuan for Jessica's defense. Several witnesses, including the cafe staff, were called upon and testified in the trial. Cafe staff and Jessica reenact the incident in court. During the trial, there was no hard evidence that proves Jessica actually planned and carried out the murder. There were no CCTV cameras capturing Jessica lacing the coffee with cyanide. Jessica's house was also searched, but there was no trace of cyanide found. On the other hand, the prosecutors pointed out the suspicious and unusual behaviors of Jessica, arriving hours early at the cafe, ordering coffee one hour in advance, and placing bags on the table that concealed the drink from CCTV. Forensic pathologist Jaja Surya at Maja testified in the trial that Myrna might have been poisoned, but possibly not with cyanide. Owing to a lack of an autopsy report, he doesn't know whether Myrna died of an illness. According to him, even though there was 0.2 milligrams of cyanide in Myrna's gastric fluid, she didn't die from cyanide poisoning. It is normal for cyanide to be found in gastric fluid because such a substance is commonly present in the environment. Therefore, he asserts that a small amount of cyanide would not be lethal to a person. Australian forensic pathologist Beng Beng Ong also testified during the trial that the level of cyanide found in Myrna's stomach was not consistent with fatal poisoning. To determine the cause of death, he suggested that an autopsy should be performed. Professor Ronnie Nidabaskara testified that, based on physiognomy, Jessica exhibits facial features associated with a vengeful nature. His assessment suggested that Jessica's emotions were highly changeable, she harbored a strong desire for love, faced challenges in maintaining relationships, disliked criticism, was sensitive, and could be spiteful. Strangely, Jessica who always wore a smile, was observed crying when Professor Ronnie testified in the trial. It was reported in 2021 that Professor Ronnie passed away at the age of 77. During the trial, Jessica shared her inhumane and scary experience while in police custody. She claimed to be threatened with the death penalty, involuntarily hypnotized, and forced to participate in reconstructions of the crime. It was alleged that the police illegally searched her parents' house without a warrant. After nearly a five-month trial, the Indonesian court delivered their verdict. Jessica Kamala Wongso has been legally and convincingly proven guilty of committing premeditated murder and has been sentenced to 20 years in jail. Jessica claimed she doesn't accept this verdict because it's unfair and one-sided, she insisted to the end that she was innocent. During the trial, Jessica swore that she wasn't a murderer and that Myrna knows she never poisoned her. After hearing the decision of the panel of judges, we feel concerned and disappointed because the panel did not consider everything thoroughly, especially the evidence. I am deeply disappointed with the panel because they acted like prosecutors, personally attacking us, not to mention their profession as advocates in Indonesia. In our opinion, 
a wise and prudent judge should not speak in such a manner. This decision is very unfair and biased. In this court, we have witnessed the tolling of the death bell of justice. We firmly declare that we will appeal. There were opinions that Jessica may not yet have had a fair trial, largely due to the fact that the evidence against Jessica has always been circumstantial. Additionally, there was limited CCTV footage available. The trial largely consisted of expert witnesses opining about Jessica's mental state and post-mortem tests on Myrna's body, even without a full autopsy. Even before the verdict, Edward Omar Sharif Hayarij, a criminal law expert from Gaja Mata University, stated that circumstantial evidence would be sufficient for the court to decide on a premeditated murder case. This incident has brought robust business to Olivier. According to the waitresses, since the incident happened, business is booming, and it's become a tourist attraction. Guests frequently asked to sit in the booth where the women sat. The cafe once announced that the operation of the coffee machine was stopped for an hour due to overheating, and the Vietnamese coffees quickly sold out. In 2019, Daitha, then an intern student at the State University of Jakarta majoring in public education, had the rare opportunity to meet Jessica at women's prison Pondok Bamboo while conducting training for the prisoners as part of her schoolwork. Daitha and her schoolmates saw how kind and friendly Jessica was and couldn't believe she had the heart to kill her friend. Whenever Jessica's mother visited and delivered food, Jessica generously offered and shared them with Daitha and her friends. In Netflix's 2023 documentary film, Ice Cold, Jessica was briefly interviewed before the authorities cut it off. It was just really strange. If the media wasn't really keen on me at that time, would it be different? Sorry, it's just really yeah. uh. Myrna's father, Eddie Darmowin Salahin, who appeared in the Netflix documentary, criticizes the film for distorting reality. He alleges that the documentary is misleading and does not depict the truth of the incident. He also took the opportunity during the same interview session to apologize profusely, as he might come across as arrogant in the film.